Uh, noon at Midtown Manhattan, another day on planet Earth, and with us we have again a great Carol Moss, a significant voice in the landscape of uh, U.S., New York, but global theater, and it's a big honor and uh, and a great uh, 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 great gift to us to have her with us. Thank you, Carol, for joining us. Sure, I'm happy to be here. Where this are you? Are you in Abu Dhabi or are you in Berlin, in Tokyo, Israel? What's going on? No, I am just in New York City in Greenwich Village in my NYU uh, office, and which is on the corner of uh, Broadway and uh, 8th Street. No, Waverly Place. Yes, that's where I am, my little office. You go next to the famous Waverly restaurant. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have to get there. <clears throat> and eat. Um, for all of you who do not know uh, Carol, she has been with us. She actually was uh, the one who um, co-hosted a series on what she calls the theater of the real, a theater that uh, engages with the question of reality, the documentary uh, uh, theater, and um, how to use um, a different forms to reflect uh, the new world we, we do live in. And she wrote for a long time about artists, ensembles, and companies who found new forms for the new time we live in. Um, Carol, if you forgive me, I'll read a little bit uh, about you. And not everybody does know. We have also many international viewers. Carol, as she said, is the professor of drama at the Tisch School of the Art here in uh, New York at NYU. And also, uh, she's part of the faculty at NYU in Abu Dhabi, and her books included, I encourage all of you um, to read them and or to study them or find out more about them. Um, it's a theater of the real and the dramaturgy of the real on the world stage. So this is a important theater of the real and dramaturgy of the real on the world stage. And her audience is so people think about theater, the theater lovers. Oh, here it is. Yes, the hardcover and um, and uh, book series in performance, uh, includes international anthologies of plays and performance texts, and it's published. And it almost sounds like us, the Seagull Press. Uh, I wish it would be us. It's a fantastic publishing house, and uh, uh, Carol and also with Richard, um, it have done a fantastic of a job as editors of a series that really is one of the very, very few series that a local global drama takes it serious, publishes it, comments on it, puts it out there like musicians who really listen to musicians from other places in the world to influence their own, but also to understand that we are German philosopher Kaiser Ling, forgotten the shortest way to yourself around the world. You want to really know who you are, you go around the world, and this is the same. Um, in theater, and she had guest are so many on documentary theater, performing the city, the return of the real, and she has uh, so many fellowships and uh, taught at so many universities, and has been a keynote speaker and uh, uh, contributed to uh, uh, gatherings of uh, people who share it. Um, it's way too long to find out, Carol. Really, um, Thank you again for for um, joining us. So, how has the year been for you? Um, it's you know it, it it's get it's we're at this moment in New York City at least where it's spring. It's late spring. It feels a bit like summer. Things are opening up. Um, it's also a time where you know, where we begin to ask, well, what do we make of the past year and a half? You know, and the, the sense of that uh, year and a half is um, evaluating in a certain way and not in a certain way. I begin in, uh, uh, the semester teaching a blended class, um, part on Zoom and part live here at Tisch School of the Arts. My uh, family did not want me to teach live and I kept saying, just let me try it. I know that a lot of the students in the class had taken class with me before. 
So I kind of knew their, their habits and their behavior. And um, the surprise was when I came to Tish, um, uh, it was empty. I, you know, it was just the security guard in the lobby. The elevators were empty. I went to the classroom you know, the six students in the room arrived. That was it. After class was over, I didn't see anybody. Um, but gradually, so that, and I worked very hard to get, you know, the coordination between the live presence in the room and the students on Zoom. Of course, what we all know now, what happened over the course of the semester is that the students in the room began to attend on Zoom because it's just too easy to, you know, wake up and stagger over to your computer and not have to get dressed for class or whatever, not that they get dressed up for class. And then in the spring, I taught two classes on Zoom, both, uh, both courses. Um, and, you know, all in all, it was fine. It was, uh, <clears throat> I felt like NYU did a very good job with safety protocols and procedures. And in my department, the Department of Drama, <clears throat> excuse me, everyone was very um, kind and attentive and, you know, constantly acknowledging the situation, which helped a lot. Uh, I did feel sorry for the students um, on the one hand that, you know, I heard from the students who in the spring were studying remotely. They were freshmen and uh, <clears throat> they were still in there in their homes, in their childhood bedrooms, attending college. And, um, you know, they were a bit at sea, but, you know, I did give them certain moments to talk about it without wanting too much to shift away from the subject of the class. So that's, you know, that's been their extraordinary experience on the one hand, and I feel sorry for them. On the other hand, you know, somehow this experience is going to be, I think, generatively um, uh, productive in the way they think about their future and the future of the planet and um, governments and art in ways that, you know, we shall see. Um, so just like living through all kinds of huge traumatic moments socially with a bunch of other people, or in this case with the whole world, um, gives us a common um, point of departure, uh, frame of reference in ways that I think are unprecedented. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's been, it's been, you know, and, and now there is uh, 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 this very different moment that's already emerged and um, yeah. Yeah, and how, how are students, how are they doing, how are they feeling in this time? What, what do you sense? Um, so I, I, there was, a tremendous outpouring of creativity in terms of using digital media um, uh, generatively, um, uh, finding ways to make it work, finding ways to let it replace the live experience. Um, and I, I think that was, you know, really in the mode of meeting the emergency of the situation and wanting education to continue. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I don't think it has yet tipped over from functionality to real aesthetic innovation, although there are some indications of that. So I think they're doing okay. I think right now NYU, like many places have said, we're going to be all in person in the fall. And uh, there's good news about vaccines and about back, uh, certain, especially I think Moderna and Pfizer really um, having a great uh, lifespan in terms of their protection. So I, I think there's this, this other moment that is upon us, which is you know, helping us survive the rest of the summer and think back on, on the past year and a half. Um, yeah. And, and how, how was it for you? I mean, education is a trans It's one of those things that dramatically distinguishes us from other species. You know, we are able to transfer knowledge, also different knowledge. And, um, but as you say, the childhood homes, you are at home, or 
So how did you deal with all of it? And how did you feel as a person, as Carol, how did, how did it go? Um, you know, I, I, I kind of subscribe to the theory that after the trauma is over, is when one really begins to feel what they have been feeling and to sort it out, right? And to reflect upon it. So um, it, it's kind of like surviving the year and a half and you know, we were very fortunate, everything is fine with families and friends, um, but surviving it was the only mode. Now we have a little bit more space because we're coming out of it to think about it. And so, you know, I, I, I personally feel a bit of mourning for, a, you know, the, the, the bits of life that were kind of taken away from us all. Um, and, uh, and I just have to think about that. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Many say it also listens you're confined, you can't on the other hand, you're constantly, you, are, you don't have solitude. And uh, did it have an effect on your writing or how, how was it for you? On a um, yeah, I will say you're breaking up just a touch. It's better, I think, Frank, still when you're closer to your computer. Yeah. So, you know, the, the first thing I wrote, I think you've read actually, it was called Requiem. And that was, I wrote it last summer and, and it was supposed to be like a paragraph and it turned out to be like, I don't know, 15 to 18 pages. And I, I felt like I just needed to uh, pour everything into that. And that was very, so that was like, I could um, write something that was articulating my experience at the moment. And that was very, very good at that moment. But that was uh, June, right? 2020. We know. On a raft, right? We were like. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, it, the city was empty. Uh, all we saw were, were, food met, were food deliverers, you know, riding around on their bicycles, few and far between. And, you know, you felt like you were risking your life to go outside. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so it, it was it, writing this one piece in particular was uh, uh, a kind of lifesaver. If, if you don't mind, Frank, I just want to read that first one of the first paragraphs of that piece. And it's published in TDR and it's called Requiem. But I wrote, uh, when this is over, we will have collectively gone through the time of the coronavirus in different ways, in different places, and uniquely among diverse people, but also all together. We will remember the rapidly changing consciousness, the uncertainty, and the radically fluctuating notions of the near and distant future. And that was one of the, one of the strange disruptions of time that happened in the, you know, at the advent of the pandemic. This consciousness of what we did, how we adapted, of the overlap, of the isolation of the virus and the kind of massive public outpouring on the streets to protest the murder of George Floyd, a protest that spread around the world, will inform everything artists and scholars do and think. The new normal will have a new consciousness. Um, so the essay felt like I was writing for my life, right? And I was trying to grasp something that, um, of course, could not entirely be grasped at that moment. But that's one of the wonderful things about writing, it brings stuff into focus. Um, and uh, you mentioned the raft of Medusa, and the, the turbulentness of it. And I agree, it was like everything was in stasis and in turbulent motion at the same time. It was like kind of being caught in the eye of a storm and moving while staying still. So, um, and, and now there's this new emergent, different moment. Um, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 it touched me, I was thinking it was important. Also, th theoretically, let's say you would get a corona infection and you would end up in the wrong hospital. It could be the last thing you, you wrote. One had a feeling there was some urgency and seriousness to it that, um, 
stood out in a way from a world where normally, you know, we like musicians, you know, let's play the same song variations over decades where you learn and play, go back to, but this, I think, um, it's good, uh, so, um, what about now? Did, did you see any theater? Did you, did you, uh, were you able to go out and see work and after that moment of, uh, uh so live theater um you know i watched some stuff online i wasn't driven like many people were to watch a bunch of stuff online um uh, during the during the school year during the two semesters i i felt real zoom fatigue staring at my students on the screen and um, i also had two honors thesis students um and that was a very intense and, and wonderful experience, but I felt like I was so much on Zoom and then just regular faculty meetings and other things. But, you know, um, I will say that, I, you know, I re this is what I'm trying to make sense of. So the last work I saw before the pandemic was Okada's Eraser Mountain. Mm -hmm. And um, at Spurball, and it, you know, as you, did you see it? I think I was there the same evening when you were there. You were uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so it's a work, as you know, about environmental responsibility. You know, it questions our human-centric approach to relationships between people, objects, the environment. It kind of implicitly asks, what is our responsibility to the earth? Um, and, you know, Okada was really looking at ways in which humans displace the natural environment and at the ways that machines displace humans. Um, so, I mean, that seemed like an incredibly prescient work. Uh, once the pandemic hit, that its questions were absolutely uh, driven by the specific context of Japan and post Fukushima, the nuclear meltdown and the tsunami so many years later, and the attempt to reconstruct the environment. But at the same time, the, the central idea is what are humans doing? It was really, you know, omni an omnipresent question during the pandemic. You know, what is this? Why, why this now? How did this happen? And we, and we still don't have so many answers to those kinds of questions. Um, yeah. yeah, so. In the, in the play, they were some screws for the water. That's like putting a you know, machine that helps the Western world to do everything better. And in the big question really is, um, going back to Camus said, how can we do art in the face of starving people? How can we do theater performance? With the environmental problem that face our states very deadly. And I think this play and ask these questions. Yeah, I mean, and, and I don't know that there can ever be any kind of singular answer. You know, I mean, people can invent answers, but I don't know. And I think you can ask the same kinds of questions, you know. Uh, I mean, I always ask myself, how can we have, you know, a, a, a huge uh, number of children growing up hungry with inadequate schooling in the richest country on earth? Um, it, you know, and it, it all has to do, in my mind at least, with certain levels of enormous inefficiency, like mind-boggling inefficiency, and also the corruption of of governments and um, yeah, and others, the sort of, and institutions even, you know, unfortunately. But um, you know, I still wave the flag for art, uh, theater in particular, as as being, um, you know, it's 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 not a mere hold up to nature. It's it's really not that. It's that the theater is deeply interwoven with the current realities in ways that does critique them and reflect upon them, but is also very much a part of them um, in the ways that it's institutionalized and produced 
And, you know, there've been some conversations about revising those methods, but uh, I don't, it's not clear where they're going yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I know I talked to Mark Russell the other day and Under the Radar is gonna happen um, in 2022. He has his budget, he's thinking about it. So live performance will come back. Um, I did see, so the kind of bookends of my experience were Eraser Mountain, um, the last work I saw before the pandemic hit. And then the first work I saw was uh, last Sunday was Afterward Ness. I don't know, did you see it? It's by Bill T. Jones at the Park Avenue Armory. And, um, you know, I, I followed Bill T. Jones on and off for a long time. So the whole thing has this resonance of, I know this man's work. I, I'm familiar with the phases of his work from early on when he was dancing with um, Arnie Zane. And um, yeah, so I, I think afterwardness is, is a, a reflection on the pandemic, on the murder of black men and women, on the loneliness of isolation, on survival, on time, uh, extending before and after humans. That's the other thing, a kind of emergent notion of time as being a, fundamentally apart from humanness has entered our consciousness. Um, uh, in, uh, this, it, it was meticulously done beautifully. The space was uh, divided into areas with a central performing area and kind of avenues that flowed in and out of it. And uh, all the dancers and all the spectators wore masks. So I think that made it doubly safe. We, had, we showed our, um, our, uh, our vaccination certification on our phones to get in. They may have had an area for non-vaccinated people, I'm not sure, um, but it was beautifully designed. Um, the movement didn't have a linear arc, but it was like portions of phrases from earlier works of Bill T. Jones. And there was this wonderful kind of fleet-footed runner um, who seemed to come from nowhere and end up nowhere, just rushing through the environment. Um, so, you know, it was it, clearly afterwardness refers to the pandemic. And there was some kind of iteration of dates, not dates that I could attach specific events to, but the last date was the premiere of the performance. So it was very much about us now, but at the same time, not literal um, at all, not realistic. Uh, evocative, suggestive, uh, summoning our collective experience. I, I mean, I loved it. I thought it was really, really, really beautifully, really beautifully done. And it was well laid out in terms of COVID. We were, we were walked in by ushers in a spaced way. And the seats were spaced really far apart. So you couldn't really feel the other people, but you could see them all, right? And you could, you know, there was some kind of ambiance. Yeah, so that's as far as I've gotten in terms of live performance. Um, well, for someone who most probably goes a couple of times a day, but the first time since last, last March, now it's um, almost June, how did it feel? In, uh, I mean, that's what we miss so much, all of a sudden it's back. So how did the moment feel? How can you, did it live up to what you were thinking? How did it be? Or was it different or more? I got a little weepy standing in line, waiting to be let in. Um, uh, and then when we were, it, you know, it, there was an officialness to it and, and a formality because they were intent upon keeping people well-spaced apart. And, um, and then there was just like this, for me, relaxation into just watching the dancing. And there was opera and a beautiful clarinet player and um, some street sound effects here and there. So there, uh, for me, there a great sense of 
of, of uh, relaxing into the aesthetic experience and just letting it flow over me. Um, yeah, and so I wasn't disappointed, you, you know. Uh, it was different though. It had all the markings of COVID still being present. Um, so yeah, it's hard to describe. Did, did you forget, forget about the COVID? It wasn't always um, present. Forget about the... the... The situation we are in, or what do you, were you immersed in watching it? No, 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 because the perform the, the dancers were wearing masks. I was wearing a mask. Um, that the situation in which we're, that we're still in was constantly enunciating itself. At the same time, the whole the whole dance, the whole idea of the choreography was kind of both looking at what we've been through, being very careful about now, with some touches, with some glances to the future. Right there, um, there was also, you know, at one point, a beautiful, beautiful white column of light that one dancer walked through, which reminded me of an earlier. Um, Bill Chi Jones' work called Still Here, um, which had a, a huge kerfuffle about it when the New Yorker critic Arlene Croce criticized it because shortly before Still Here, Bill T. Jones had announced publicly that he was HIV positive. And she, she called it victim art, but she never saw it. But in fact, it was a beautiful piece about um, both surviving and facing terminal illness, right? So, you know, there were uh, kind of, when you follow someone's work, you can see layers of, of frames of reference. Um, yeah, it was all good. I know that the Park Armory is also going to do uh, Enemy of the People next or something. Yeah, yeah, those things. It will be uh, will be coming uh, coming back as over the last months since closer and closer to us with this emergency moment now it feels like the detonations are slowly fading away and um, in this landscape where we walk through and um, and um, so how was how change the office market? Are you a different person? Will you teach differently? Will you think differently? Will you organize your life differently? Uh, yeah, I think teaching differently, you know, already um, uh, is there. And uh, I'll continue to develop new teaching techniques. The students are... Um, I'm, uh, I forgot what it is we read and I said, you know, they love to go into breakout rooms because they're without me. <laughs> Basically, they get to chat for a few seconds among one another and then they have to address a specific question or issue and then come back and, and give an account of their discussion and their thinking. But I gave them a choice of several things. I said, oh, or do you want to discuss this in relationship to, to uh, the Capitol riot or George, the murder of George Floyd, and they divided. They wanted those two things more than a highly uh, theoretical relationship to theater. So, um, you, you know, being really sensitive to the opportunity to build in uh, uh, understanding the emergence from theater and performance thinking to to situations, events, realms outside of specific theater, plays, performance is one of the things I'm going to do more of. I mean, I've always done it to a certain degree in my theater, the real class, because it takes a, a significant context to understand some of the performances and plays and literature and theories, but I, I, I'll continue to develop that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So since since you mentioned 
Um, you know, it's still it's still a, 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 a really hot subject, and um, artists all over the world are really working in within what I call theater of the real. I think um, uh, it, it's less about literal documentation. Um, and, and less shy about combining fiction and nonfiction and more um, uh, provocative in the use of the stage space. So <clears throat> I think initially with the idea of both verbatim, which is the term that comes out of the UK and I describe as driven by interviews, that are then reproduced verbatim on stage and documentary that are the result of, uh, you know, trial transcripts, letters, diaries, and maybe some interviews that part of the impulse originally was then to stage all that realistically. Um, so in a British play, The Color of Justice, um, which is about the, uh, an inquiry into, the McPherson inquiry into why five white men, young men, got away with murdering a young black man. And, um, uh, and the aesthetic impulse was to stage it exactly like the inquiry room with computers and, and now I, I think that kind of literal staging, those ideas are, have kind of evaporated as far as I know. I haven't seen anything coming out of the UK lately. Remember Nicholas Kent, when we talked to him, said he was working on a new thing. Um, so, uh, so I don't know, how do we see this? We see this in, you know, it was always there. We, we look at the work of Rabbi Mue that he, he was never, he was the performed lecture and that's what he is the leading expert still at. But none of it was in, it was in the mode of realism. Um, uh, or if we look at the work of, uh, of Milo Rao, that he's, he's using the stage space in ways that, that, are, that reveal the rehearsal process, that reveal the constructiveness of theater. So, so I think that finally that, you know, peering through the fourth wall effect is, has gone away from this kind of theater. As far as I know, it can change any moment. Um, you know, there's, there's also, um, you know, Milo Rao says he's, he's revisiting and revising tragedy, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. And um, a lot of this work is about tragic events. So the whole question of, how do we understand tragedy now is an important question on theater artists' minds in, in really interesting ways that make us revisit Greek tragedy um, and some of its pillars, assumptions from Aristotle onwards, um, and some of the ways that we've understood certain plays like the Oresteia, for instance, which is, you know, celebrated as, as the beginning of democracy, but um, uh, yes, but people are taking another look at that. There's a woman, um, I think she was on Siegel Talks, Avra Siridopoulou is doing a contemporary anthology on modern Greek tragedy, which I'm, I'm actually in, but I'm really looking forward to what people have to say. Um, yeah, so, you know, you said it as more conservative right wing you know than we think, right? That it's not on the as much on the side. I lost the last part of what you were saying. She she um argues that perhaps not as much on the side of democracy as we wish. Yeah. Uh we, we have to remember that Athena Athena cuts a deal. Uh, with Orestes so that he won't attack Athens from Argos. 
she turns the Furies into the humanities and disempowers them and makes them, you know, household goddesses. She says she will always be on the side of the male. And, you know, that's slightly prejudicial. So it, it, I think the impulse is to look at, okay, yeah, it was good. I mean, it was the, it was the end of this uh, uh, cycles of murder by retribution. At the same time, the juried system of democracy had certain um, blind spots that we still need to address and that we are addressing. I think, you know, in the United States in particular with, with African Americans and, and with women and with Asian Americans and with Jews, that we really need to, to be very conscionable in new ways about our, our whole justice system. Um, and so, uh, and so the, the pillars of, of tragedy as we know it in theater are shifting, I think, in interesting ways and have the possibility of contributing um, a new, a new, new perspectives to the public forum. Um, uh, so, you know, even with Aristotle, it, there is the prescribed recognition and reversal happening at the same moment and then catharsis. I think uh, that's no longer part of modern tragedy for the most part. And really importantly, there's, there's mostly no, there's denouement, there's, the piece has to end in some way, but there's no catharsis, there's no, you know, exit from the emotions that the piece arouses. And, you know, I think we see that in, in both uh, Milo Rao's work and in Rabie Rue's work, they're, they're both people I've written about, so they're always in the forefront of my brain, but in many other works as well. Mm -hmm. um, if you talk about Milo Rao, I know you wrote, recently wrote an article. What fascinates you? What do you think is new in his work? Why do we need to look at it? Um, you know, I, I, I think he's making theater even more transparent than Brecht ever imagined. Um, and that his his the particular thing I like about his work is the construction of the stage space. So typically in the work I've seen thus far, there's the central performing area. There are tables on the side of the stage. And for me, at least the tables give some indication of a rehearsal room process. Um, there's a large center screen Sometimes things are live feed, sometimes they're pre-recorded. Um, there is in uh, Five Easy Pieces and La Reprise, there's the staging of the process of auditions. And during the staging of, of auditions, there's a, a, a kind of revealing about the mechanisms of theater being both for real and faked at the same time like in La Reprise, one of the professional actors teaches an amateur actor how to do a fake slap. And in Five Easy Pieces, uh, the onstage director, who's, who's a character, says to one of the children, you know, it's, it, it's, it's like you, you're, you're angry, but you're not angry at the same time, right? And also in, in La Reprise, one of the actors says, his parents are from Benin, so he gets cast as the Arab, right? So, and, uh, and um, so the whole idea of typecasting, one of the characters said, one of the, one of the uh, non-professional actors says, he looks like the murderer, one of the murderers. And so then later we see him play one of the murderers. So, you know, theaters, the way theater is entwined with reality and also wants to pull at that fabric of being entwined simultaneously is very interesting. And then, you know, like all good theater, perhaps, um, the, both Rue and, uh, and Milo Rao really tell us something we didn't already know. This is a story we haven't heard before. I think for Five Easy Pieces, it was a relationship of, of Belgian colonialism 
to uh, life in contemporary Bel Belgium after colonialism and the kind of a, a certain kind of mindset that it was or is still operative. Um, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. You you watch Milo Raud as well, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were a bit involved in presenting his uh, school of persistence. We hope maybe there's a way to bring him to New York and this little festival idea we have there. Some some promising signs that it might happen. I like what you said about him. You said he actually not just mirrors the world um, for a time at least that was already okay for the theater. Of course, right? It's no longer okay. But also, you say Milo Rao mirrors the theater, holds opera up to the theater. And I think that is like observation um, you, you, you made. Um, yeah, yeah, he's uh, so, you know, I, I can talk a little bit about. Um, some of the stuff in theater of the real that is is now so different from documentaries so if we think of peter weiss's the investigation it, you know it's it's an early indication of a different notion of theatricality what is the investigation in german the ermittlung and it's about the Court the Germans themselves had at Frankfurt, not the Nuremberg trials, which were number the Germans themselves and put the dialogues, you know, together as a as a documentary. But it was the beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Frank it was the Frankfurt Auschwitz trial. Yes. And, yeah, and, and Vice sat through portions of it in the courtroom, and then it was all published in the newspaper. But what he does with all of that material is transform it into, I believe, nine cantos, or I'd have to look again. But he gives this cautionary tale at the beginning: is this is it, this shouldn't be theatricalized. It shouldn't be performed emotionally. It should be about facts and figures. And the whole play, uh, it has so many numbers in it. Um, and it was criticized initially for that. But, but what I really wanna talk about is the idea that Weiss had in relationship to that play was that in no way should it pre be presented in realistic terms, that these, these uh, people um, uh, come on stage, they, they give their whatever their uh, testimony is, and then they leave the stage. So that is, is not wholly up a mirror to nature. That's not about realism. That, that is about uh, configuring and reconfiguring a, an enormous body of information in a very succinct way with a very uh, specific outcome. Um, and, uh, and it doesn't, you know, the only thing that changes over the course of that particular play is that the Nazi method of extermination becomes more efficient. Um, and at the center of the play, there's two lives put next to one another, a young SS officer and a young woman in the camp. Um, and, they, uh, and they're put in contrast with one another. But it, it, it's not about a literal or realistic representation of the trial or of the scenes that the trial stages in our minds, right? So I, I think that a lot of, of stuff, especially that comes out of Europe, not England, but out of Europe, is, uh, is really following in that tradition, the not literal, not realistically portrayed. And I think there are many different kinds of reasons for that. Mm -hmm. what, what are the reasons? Why do you think it's changing our... Uh, part of it is um, the way the institutional funding of theater has worked with assurance of audiences. 
and the cultivation of uh, greater and greater degrees of sophistication in audiences. Um, part of it is uh, also, I think, certain European theater makers being enamored with experimental American theater artists who began touring to Europe from the late 60s onward. And, and you know, like the Wooster Group or um, the, the Performance Group tour to Europe, I don't even know, um, Mabu Minds, that this was radically experimental stuff that European theater makers of a certain kind were enamored with and they began making theater in those forms and dance as well. I know Bill T. Jones many times and um, also, you know, in Germany in particular, there's a lot of German dance scholars who have worked on Trisha Brown or early postmodern dance. So I think the idea of the experimental was already there. And, and also Pina Bausch, you know, who had major institutional support and funding in a theater of her own. And that makes a huge difference in terms of of the imaginative reach space of theater, where you're not bound to an audience that only wants to see versions of things in ways that they're already familiar with. Mm. Yeah, I remember for one of our CETO talks, uh, you invited from your tradition hotel model, that kind of a quite a stunning uh, interpretation of theater. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they do it with little puppets and yeah, a grant, a grant. again, it's really about a certain kind of uh, scenography, right? Where the scenography itself is, is much, much more sophisticated than it's ever been in the past. It's not just, oh, let's make a living room look like a living room or an office like an office. Um, but but it, it becomes its own iteration of meaning and content and its own artistic form, I think more so than ever before in certain ways, you know. But again, you know, if we look at Robert Wilson, who you know well, that his idea of sonography was very, very much in that mode. So another American artist who, you know, who has transplanted to, to Germany and- What was interesting, he, remember he once said, you know, if you really want to see a Baroque chair, you put it in a modern room. If yes. it's in a Baroque the baroque style you will not even see it you want to see a computer put it into a 17th century you know this versailles setting you know so um that idea of what is really real and what you see is not the the reproduction it's, it's a little also on screen now right and the work that was done and not only often theater artists on television or it could be filmed on the screen that it looked like like a, a, a film or television um, did you watch a, you said you did not watch that what did you see in that time what made you think is there anything that inspired you also from your field from you created in a way that he, many people of course wrote about also of the theater of the real marvin Carls and many others but you created it as hans t Sleeman created the you know the post-traumatic theater idea and many wrote about it, you know, Andrzej Bird, Richard, Schreckner also, and uh, so many others. But you kind of mapped that field out. For that year and a half, what signals did you get in the field you surveyed? And did you like it, what you see? Uh, well, one of the things that, in my mind, is connected to Theater of the Real, but is entirely different at the same time, is that I was part of an Aster American Society of Theater Research Seminar devoted to the idea of memorial. So in the United States, we, had, we are, we had gone through the idea of taking down certain kinds of statues and memorials. And there was uh, a lot of passion and uh, public debate and history revealed around certain memorials. But I had already begun thinking about house museums as uh, which I've been looking at for a while, as, as, uh, as connected to my work on Theater of the Real, in that they are, they are scenographic. They're a staging, if you will, of someone's life. Some of them are absolutely 
for the most part, authentic. They are the house as it was when the person last lived in it. Some of them are kind of reconstructions. This is what we thought the wallpaper was, and we found a couch from the period to give an indication of what the house might have been like when the person lived in it. And um, so uh, I think the most authentic one that I have visited is Musée Nassim de Commando in Paris. Um, and uh, they, the uh, de Commando family donated it to, to Paris on the condition that they would keep everything as it was. And he was an eh, 18th century, 19th century art collector. I'd have to review that. So there's there a tremendous amount of art. And then the family was extinguished by the Holocaust. Um, so the monument speaks of both their life and, and their devotion to Paris and French culture and the end of their life. They thought they were French. Of course, this is a very common story among Jews, but it turns out the French didn't think they were French. Um, so, and, you know, then there, there's some fabulous ones. There's Frederick, Frederick Douglass House in Washington, D.C., which actually sits on a hill and looks over, looks over the Capitol. And when we visit, my daughter, Sophia, was the one who said, we have to go visit this place. And we did. And uh, we were late, so it's all, it was all by appointment. This was before the pandemic, and uh, we had missed our appointment. So we were standing at the foot of the stairs to Frederick Douglass House, and there was a large extended Black family going in. We were just standing there, and I just said, we missed our appointment. And they said, join us. And it was uh, an incredible experience um, because the Dawson was really quizzing us in black history as we walked through Frederick Douglass's house. And, um, you know, and of course, when you're there, a lot of his writing comes alive and you understand something else about his life and how he lived and how, where his life ended. Um, and so I, I, I'm still working this out, but I, I think that these house museums, which look, really exist there, I mean, we can visit Brecht's house, right? Um, outside of Berlin, that they um, are, are, are little explored in terms of how they stage the spectator, in terms of what it means to be in the middle of the scenography of someone's life, um, the, both the, their presence and their absence, and the, and the sense of, of intimacy of a life, like when you're in their home, and um, and in the sense of the way in which their, their houses are used for purposes for a specific maybe governmental, institutional, uh, social, cultural purposes other than the occupant may have originally intended their house to be used. So I'm thinking a lot about that. And, and that was easier for me to think about during the pandemic because I had visited so many places but I, uh, I actually lost a huge chunk of research funding completely, um, was rescinded because of the pandemic and it happened to everybody. You, uh, the, the, you lost the research through NYU or through a foundation and outside? Oh, uh, through NYU Abu Dhabi, they, they usually let us roll over our research funds, but the, the crisis was just too great and it happened to everyone. So yeah, so that's where I, I am now with all of that. Yeah, it, it, it'll happen for sure. Go ahead. What? Go ahead. You were, you were saying something. Um, yeah, so that's, I spent a lot of time thinking about that. I did watch some, some I wrote, what did I write? I wrote about Milo Rao's La Reprise during the pandemic. Um, and and uh, and I just finished this essay on tragedy for Avra, and uh, and that's very nice to think about because tragedy definitely moves throughout all theater the real in ways that that uh, really deserve our careful attention. I'm glad Avra's doing this book, but I, I think that um, 
yeah, the tragic form offers a lot in terms of artists being able to ask certain questions about portraying violence or not. As we all know, in Greek tragedy, violence always happened off stage, and the messenger rushed on and said, hey, this just happened. Um, but like in, in Milo Rao's work, the tragedy is restaged, right? Especially in La Reprise, we, we see the murder on stage, and yet we've been already schooled in the conventions of theater, right? A real slap, a fake slap, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, who are the actors playing which parts and why? And by the way, in his work, the actors always retain their own given names, even though we also know simultaneously the names of the characters they're playing. It's a, it's a really deft feat that he does. Um, uh, Yarfi, but we see Yarfi, you know, murdered on stage, essentially in the headlights of a car. So what does it mean? So, you know, previously, certain questions, like let's say with a play, uh, The Laramie Project, about the murder of Matthew Shepard. I think that Moises Kaufman was careful not to stage the murder of Matthew Shepard on stage, right? Not to show us, but mm -hmm. then becomes, well, how do we know how horrible it was? You know, so we, of course we have to know it through narration. And so the police officer who found him, Reggie Flutie, described, I forgot who plays Reggie Flutie, but uh, describes having found Matthew Shepard. And then there are the hospital updates, which describe his condition, right? So the, the extremeness of the violence is absolutely staged in our minds, not on the literal stage. What Rao does is something different. He's showing us explicitly the violence um, reenacted and he's alerted us to the fact that this is a reenactment, but why does he have to show us? What does it mean? What does it do to our understanding of how, uh, of the replication of violence, right? And I think, I don't know how to answer that entirely, but one of the, one of the ideas that Rao in particular is dealing with is, is the way in which theater is entangled with real life. And is there a, an analogy or a correlation to be made between how we learn to act the role of a murderer and how we learn to murder in daily life. And he, he kind of puts those things next to one another in no uncertain terms uh, in La Reprise. So, you know, that's the amazing thing about his work. It's not only the story, it's about the implications of the story and the implications of telling the story, right? So it, it is in a certain sense that modern tragedy, you know, if we, in, in the most progressive ways looks asks us again and again to look beyond the frame of the theatrical, right? Um, always in the theater and outside of the theater, right? It's almost like when we're in the theater, we're being asked to also look beyond the frame of the theatrical. And then when we go outside the theater, we're asked to think back on the frame of the theatrical, right? Yes. So, I mean, it's just, it's fascinating. It's just, it's, it's really, I don't like this word, but it's actually really brilliant. And, and layered, you know, uh, complexity. Yeah, and that the observer, the observer itself is implicated. You watch it, you know, and, and um, you know, there was this one documentary film, a fake one, you know, where a crew was following a murderer and then they kind of things didn't work out, helped him to commit the murder because they were filming, they didn't have more time. You know, the question of, and of course this was, as you said, about us and our lives, you know, so where do we murder? And and at Milo often talks about um, that there is no pure art, you know, that even doing the art himself, he does not really. That's something healthy, something that is, you know, just aesthetic, that even for him working already also is committing some kind of crimes, ignoring realities. And, um, but as you said, he, 
close it. So what do you predict, do you see um, for, for, for your field or theory in general, what do you think will happen um, when things open? Uh, so, you know, the whole world has been through a traumatic time and I think we have to deal with it. And, you know, I was talking to Mark Russell the other day and he says, I think we need joy. And maybe, I'm, but I actually think that may or may not happen because I think that we've learned many profound things that we're not yet entirely aware of. Um, and we've learned something about time. A whole young, young, young generation has been schooled on thinking about the omnipresence of death. So usually um, until now, Till recently, or you know, maybe in the past hundred years, we've had the great gift of feeling. Many of us, I'm talking about a privilege world, that we're immortal until we like maybe turn fifty or sixty. There's a sense of I'm going to live forever, right? Coin to paraphrase that famous song. But now I think young people may not have that sense of um, eternally young, eternally immortal until they turn a certain age, right? Uh, many of them have, I heard from my students, family members who became ill and they had to suddenly be the, the, the adult in the home while going to school and dealing with a frightening illness. Some of them lost family members some of them saw, you know, stupid mistakes in terms of um, maybe family parties and people getting ill. Um, I also think our, our sense of time, really following Okada's work, is uh, it, 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 it is very different now. Remember, you know, at one point uh, it was hard to remember what day it was. Yeah, and, and that was very, very, very disorienting. So uh, cutting loose from a sense of clock time, a sense of institutional time, um, but of course, calendrical time in terms of the seasons remains. So I think we have a, a different notion of time. I think, you know, you can hear the sirens of New York City, um, which are always much too loud. Um, Someone going to a hospital, right? Or is it a fire somewhere, or is it just someone getting home faster? You know, after yeah, is it yeah, is it now normal? Yeah, we don't know. Um, yeah, you know, I also think the thing we reverted to Zoom and you know Zoom performances and and uh, that was all good, but I think it was more um, you know to meet the crisis of the moment. I think the deeper conversations about technology and media are, should hopefully have to reemerge. And of course, the person who's most uh, significant to date in terms of understanding technology is Rabi. In his pixelated revolution, he was really asking, uh, uh, what, you know, look, the, 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 what, what the Syrian protesters were uploading to YouTube was in fact more legitimate than the legitimate sources of the news, which were contro controlled by the state. I think now, uh, so the whole question of, of what is truth, how do we know it, how do we assess it, has to you know, again reemerge. When this documentary theater you know, became omnipresent, there was also at the same time a kind of postmodernism about idea about how the truth can't be known. But I, I think a lot of the theater practitioners were really asserting, look, we know the story, we can show you why these well, five young white thugs were not convicted when they murdered a young black man. We can find the truth, we can trace it back, and we can even find the, the source of, in this case, of the McPherson inquiry, the unconscious racism that was operating. I, I, I think that that 
that there'll be hopefully a lot more inquiry into the into the mediatization of everything and um and and what our relationship is to knowing what happened what enabled it to happen what its implications are for the future of any kind of event um and and that's a big question you know i think uh I, I, uh, I alerted you to the work at one point of Timothy Snyder, a Yale historian, who really says, the moment we say we, we cannot know what the truth is, is the moment that we become kind of vulnerable. In fact, I'm paraphrasing to fascist governments. And I think that, you know, around the world, we've seen the way that that operates, perhaps in India, perhaps with the previous administration in the United States. That that feel that feeling signed on to the indeterminacy of what we can know and the truth itself, in fact, makes us extremely vulnerable, right? Um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that there is there is a truth out there, and that there are facts out there, and I think the role of artists uh, and also scientists has to, be to you know. Uh, look for the truth. I remember in Germany, we don't have the big uh, celebrations you know, in uh, PhD thesis, but you know, someone takes your hand and says, are you, do you swear to search for the truth, nothing but the truth, only the truth? And then you say yes, and then you get your, you know, you think that's it. You know, there is no uh, 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 throwing the heads in the air. Musicians do it in songs. They try to find the truth. So there is some, it's part of it, but there is something like a truth and that we have learned. And the inability of those baby boomer, perhaps the Quanon generation, the conspiracy theory people, they did not grow up like this generation. You know, this protest area, or as we had on our air, um, these incredible news from uh, Chile, the young generation, the high school kids who said, we're not gonna do the, uh, uh, subway fair we ask everybody to go on strike go outside it became a very big movement and the result is you know, there was a landslide victory in the election the constitution will be rewritten the constitution uh, pinochet it, it put it into place and the reason is that kids young especially what's true what is not true in that generation so didn't grow up with it a culture a drug from their own culture, you know, we say like alcohol, you know, like Mariana, whatever, you don't grow up with it, you don't know what to do with it, it can be devastating. And I think it's an online world where you are not being taught what you did in your classes you know, with speed of the real and you know, ask us to, 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 in, to inquire what's really true and make up your own mind. Hannah Arendt said uh, uh, in this great collection of essays, Thinking Without Bannisters, you know, you have to think for yourself. You have to make up your own mind. You cannot follow just uh, something there is a truth. And, and once you refer, and she went back actually to the Frankfurt trial and said, someone told me, I did not think for myself. This is when fascism creeps and this is why I think freedom performance has this big, big uh, uh, mission to help us to get adapted to this time we live in, and perhaps in one of the best ways things and uh, and as Lesson said that was a fear of imagination and in theater we can imagine and people can follow that or in their seats for an hour or two about the story they already know the ending like I said let's see how it goes yeah 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 well Hannah Arndt also said that um justice takes place I'm paraphrasing behind seclusion behind closed doors um and uh, but theater is is in a certain sense, in every sense, the opposite. It's all, all, all about the public. It's all about contagion. It's I see it and I see it seated among, you know, a mass amount of spectators. And together we have, you know, more or less uh, the same experience or uh, uh, or we view the same thing. We may have different internal experiences, but so I think you know theater is is, is an incredible vehicle for um, activating public consciousness in new ways. I can say it like that. Um, and it, you know, theater real is the most current 
iteration. We have new things to deal with, the omnipresence of technology. We have a generation of students who, you know, I have to convince them to read. If you cannot read an article of 20 pages and discern the meanings, I don't know how you're going to be able to, to analyze and engage with all the stuff that's going to come at you during your life. Theater, politics, understanding the way the government works, uh, understanding you know, the way your local city government works. You, re you really, I think we need to actively, um, I, I, I'm a member of the University uh, Academic Affairs Committee for Undergraduate Education. I said, we really need to, to get them to sign on to reading again. It's the most important thing in terms of understanding the way the world works. And um, yeah, so yeah. That's impossible. I get messages back, I send one, and I get TLTR. I don't even know what it means. It means too long to read, you know? Oh. The, the person doesn't even take the time sometimes to write, to take, to write up the words. You know? But that already takes too much time. And um, But I like what you said. Um, Activating consciousness. Mm -hmm. This is a description, and I think theater and performance and art has always done that. And uh, and I hope that our talk, oops, contributed to that. A little bit. We are a little bit over time, but I, I, oh, yeah. I thought it was an important conversation. So really, um, thank you for sharing uh, and for you in the middle of your research. And uh, and I think what Carol decided also in her academic work to say, I'm going to follow. Yeah, of that's of the real state of world stages as something that perhaps is significant if we understand the world better through this way of presenting work and also audiences the complexity of the world here and they can create their own meaning. So this is an important field, an important research. I think that's something look at the practitioners to see if best work, you know, how does it work best? And after all, it is about the truth, a search for beauty, and um, and and what for what's real. And so really, uh, Carol, thank you for, for um, joining. You will join us again for a talk with this man, and that will be on the next Thursday. I think, we're going to hear I think it's Wednesday. Um, Wednesday. The, the 26th? I think it's... Uh, uh, oh, no, it's June already. Yeah, yeah, it's June already. So we're going to have next week uh, Fergus Linehan from Scotland, from the Edinburgh Theatre Festival, a great artistic director. Oh, great. Great. We're going to talk about uh, the preparation for that festival. At the moment, it looks like it might go on. What does it mean? Like we, hear, we heard from Theater de Welt and, and the Urfest Spieler will be an update from a, one of the significant places next week, Avignon, the Vienna Festival, and then Emily Mattel will be back. And then uh, Joanna Varsava and if I say on the balconies in Berlin, Rabi was part of them. Artists who live so close to work together with curators created work on their balconies for audiences to participate. Yeah, it was extremely how they did that and what it meant, and um, and perhaps also what like the future, you know, ideas for theater. What will be done? It will be an interesting. Uh, Week again. So thank you, Carol, for uh, taking the time. I know how much you work, how hard it is really to, to, uh, to teach on Zoom, having all these Zoom meetings, also for your research and talk. So, but for us, also in the moment, often books are two years later, and articles half a year. That's why articles are going like TDR, uh, PAJ magazines, MOOC sponsor, but a talk like this also perhaps the pulse a little bit of the moment and I think you uh, really um, share for that for doing this. Thanks for our listeners to stick with us. It's been such a long time now and so much more is out there but what Carol has to say is important. It's meaningful and significant I think and um, thanks for HowlRound for hosting us. So I hope to see you week and hope for a great memorial weekend for everybody. It took in the Carol talked about them, the idea of the memorials and memory and space. So we have a moment to, to think about uh, what we mean when it comes to our own life. What do we do?
is it a bad play? Would we trauma target in a meaningful way? What these are. So thank you all, and um, uh, thanks to Andy, to uh, Thea, and VJ at HowlRound, and um, uh, tune in again. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'll see you next week. See you next week. Bye bye. Thanks, Carol. Bye.